वसुदेव सुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु So in the Bhagavad Gita, we have come up to the end of the fifth chapter, and we were doing these last few verses. The fifth chapter brings together some great themes of um, monastic life, householder life, uh, Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, and then concludes by introducing the next chapter, as it were. Um, the theme is. meditation so um we saw the verse is um, 27 and 28 sparshan kritva bahir bahyan chakshus chaivantari bhruvo pranapano samo kritva nasabhyantara charino yatendriya manobuddhi मुनि मोक्ष पारायण विगते छा भय क्रोध यह सदा मुक्त योगी सो द योगी मेडिटेट्स एंड यू कैन सी इन दिस वर्स द एलिमेंट्स ऑफ द अष्टांग योग आर क्लियरली प्रेजेंट withdrawing one's um, senses from the contact with their objects that is not looking not listen or hearing sounds outside um or tasting touching smelling so um then focusing the gaze uh, control of the breath with the goal of uh, of calming the mind controlling the mind then um, control of the senses control of the mind and uh, stilling the intellect so uh, you can see the elements of uh, you know patanjali yoga here and all these things will be de- discussed in detail in the 6th chapter which is coming up when finally he concludes bhoktaram yagya tapasam sarva loka maheshwaram surhidam sarva bhutanam gyatva mam shantim ricchati so knowing me the enjoyer of all sacrifices and asceticism the great lord of all the worlds and well wisher of all beings one attains peace this is the conclusion of the fifth chapter here notice bhoktaram yagya tapasam that means all worship comes to me so who is sri krishna speaking of here uh, as himself he is speaking as the avatar as the incarnation of god in his nature as god so god is saguna brahman Well, brahman with attributes brahman with qualities the god of religion so he further uh, describes it sarva loka maheshwaram the lord of all the worlds lord of all the worlds means god in all theistic traditions god is the creator of the universe and the maintainer or sustainer preserver of the universe and ultimately it is dissolved uh, back into the lord so the lord of the universe and the controller suridam sarva bhutana the well wisher of all beings it's all being done for our for our benefit our benefit in the sense for our spiritual evolution and ultimate uh, liberation that's the purpose of the entire universe from a spiritual perspective um knowing me one attains to peace now the one important point here is knowing me uh, you know he could have said believing in me worshiping me uh, or by my grace something like that but here this whole uh, chapter has a decided thrust on gyana yoga on the way of knowledge and so it the conclusion is also interesting knowing me knowing me how uh, knowing me not only as the lord of the universe but so this is not explicitly mentioned here but in some of the commentaries for example madhusudan saraswati's commentary he brings it out he says not only as the god of the universe but as the impersonal absolute existence consciousness bliss he mentions specifically satchidananda which is your own real nature so knowing me in that way and he's 
supported in this interpretation by the verses in the fifth chapter, the earlier verses. So knowing the Lord as ultimately, not only as the Lord of the universe, not only as the one who is worshipped, to whom all worship is directed, um, not only is, is the Lord the well-wisher of all beings, that means is most gracious to all beings, but also is our innermost self or our real nature. Once we know that as our real nature, Shantim Richati attains to peace. Um, you know, one knowing Brahman, one becomes Brahman. Knowing Brahman, how does one become Brahman? I mean, knowing a cup, one doesn't become a cup, thank God. Uh, or knowing a pot, one doesn't become a pot. Knowing Brahman, one becomes Brahman only in the sense, you know, in the sense of the story of the tenth person or uh, the sense of the this, you know, the king's son who was brought up by a hunter in the forest and then finally is recognized to be the son of the king and rules the kingdom afterwards. Our real nature, which we did not know, we are not aware of, we become aware of it and therefore attain to peace. That real nature is, uh, is beyond birth and death. It's the body which is born and dies. It is the individual soul in the sense of the subtle body, Sukshma Sharira which becomes embodied in multiple bodies, goes from body to body and is seen to evolve. But we are none of them. If we are those, then there is no peace for us. Uh, at the level of materiality, either physical matter just like this, or subtle matter like our minds, our intellects, our the subtle body, prana, the, the prana maya, mano maya, vijnana maya, kosha. That's also material. Those who are studying Vedanta Sara will know. Subtle matter, we create the subtle bodies. And then gross matter. In English, we are saying gross matter. Um, the, in the Sanskrit Vedantic term is the, the pancha mahabhuta, panchikrita bhuta, which are mixed, you know, they're combined and then produces physical, what we call physical matter. That produces the physical world and our physical bodies. But all are material. The way to decide what is material or not if it is an object, it is material. Whatever is an object, jada. Jada means an object to consciousness. It is material. But one must also remember, in the sense of, in Advaita Vedanta, ultimately nothing is material. What appears to be material is also a projection of consciousness and is ultimately nothing but consciousness. It's not consciousness as an object, uh, the, ob the objectification is an appearance in consciousness, but it's real nature. What's the real nature of even gross matter, of, of the physical universe, of particles and stars and quasars? It is ultimately consciousness. Uh, it's ultimately Brahman. And we know how in Vedanta Sar, how it, the whole universe is projected from Brahman. We know that, that I am that reality. And then we attain to peace in the sense that we are beyond suffering. We are beyond uh, change. We are eternal, changeless, the spiritual nature which we are. We are not the movie, nor a character in the movie. Um, it could be a tragedy, it could be a comedy, but neither uh, affects us. They both leave us unmoved because we are the underlying reality of the movie. We are not the movie, we're not part of the movie, but the movie does not exist apart from us. That has to be realized. If it exists apart from you, if I am consciousness and everything in this matter and you stop there, it becomes Sankhya. Um, Sankhya philosophy, the yoga philosophy, which stops with the duality of consciousness and matter. Advaita goes one step further, non-dualism, which says that matter also is an appearance in consciousness and ultimately nothing apart from consciousness. All right. Now, what I want to do is, before we go to the sixth chapter, we'll take a quick look at the themes which came up in the fifth chapter, the one which we have just completed. A look back. There is a um, figure of speech used in, uh, in classical sang Sanskrit. It's called uh, Singhavalokana Nyaya. So in the forest, when the lion, the king of the forest walks in the forest, once in a while, it stands and it looks back up over its shoulder and as if looking back at the path that it has covered. So that's called Singhava Lokananaya, the figure or, or the, the uh, 
in the paradigm in which you try to see that, for example, for us, it will mean that what have we studied in the last few classes. So as lions will stop for a while, instead of moving into the sixth chapter, we look back over our shoulders at this fifth chapter. Um, it's good to think of what is happening in the Gita as a whole. One way of looking at the Gita is that the 18 chapters are divided into three sets of six, three sets of six, chapters one to six, chapters seven to um, 13, um, seven to 12, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then 13 to 18, 13 to 18. Um, and uh, why, what are these three sets? They are said to correspond to Tattvamasi, that thou art. So the first set of six chapters from chapters one to six is said to talk about thou, you, the real nature of the self, about ourselves. And the next set, which is coming up now, after we complete the sixth chapter from seventh onwards, will be the nature of that, of God of the ultimate reality. Uh, um, that means uh, the God of the uh, of religion, Saguna Brahman. And then the last six chapters are, they talk about the identity, the ultimate reality, that is Tattva Masi, um, Nirguna Brahman, where thou and that are one and the same reality, the identity of that and thou. Now, as will be quite obvious by now, that this kind of division is a very general division. For example, the, in the, one might say that in the first six chapters or first five chapters we have seen, certainly the nature of the self has been spoken about. What is the Atman? That was the first theme itself in the second chapter. But also Krishna has talked about himself as the avatara, about devotion to avatara. Uh, uh, karma yoga is there throughout all the chapters. Um, and bhakti, of course, has been mentioned as devotion to the avatar. So all the themes are there. But then why do you say it is about self, self-realization, the first six chapters? Uh, in Sanskrit, there's a word, pradhanyena, as a matter of emphasis. Yes, everything else is also there from the second chapter onwards. But uh, as a matter of emphasis, we are talking about self-knowledge in the first six chapters. Self-knowledge means knowledge of... Um, of that I am not the body, I am not the mind, I am, I am the pure consciousness, existence, consciousness, place. See, in these days, knowing oneself, self-knowledge, especially in this country, in America, can be confusing. Why? Um, just yesterday, I was looking at a video of a young student, and uh, she said that, uh, in an interview, I have discovered myself, I have known myself through, through sports. Right. So you found yourself in running. Well, that's, that's fine. You found yourself in running. Somebody's found himself in, in playing the guitar, whatever it is. From a Vedantic perspective, what you mean to say is that you feel at home there. You feel that you're enriched by that activity, by that job, by that relationship, by that identity. You feel enriched. You feel more at home. You feel you're developing. That's what you mean by I have found myself. Isn't it? There's nothing more to it than that. And from a Vedantic perspective, all of that is in the subtle body, in the sukshma sharira. Um, it's in your mind, in your samskaras, uh, in our intellect. So perhaps we have a set of talents which are now coming into play. And then I feel that, yes, this is, this is for me. Uh, perhaps uh, we find fulfillment in a particular situation. I find, yeah, yeah, this, I'm, I'm at home. I feel at home here. From a Vedantic perspective, that's not finding yourself. That is important and that's good. That's something close to what you might call Swadharma. Your, uh, if you take it in a positive sense, it's, it's uh, Swadharma means that which is most suitable for you to develop. To develop more uh, spiritually. I mean, in ancient India, Swadharma was a function of like a matrix you make of your um, varna and ashrama, um, you know, um, there, there are five elements in Swadharma. Swadharma means your own dharma. How do you know? How do I know what my own dharma is? They are actually a pretty mathematical way of finding out. I'll tell you, but it's not relevant to us here and not relevant to our society anymore. But it, it worked this way. 
Swadharma, your own dharma. If you want to know what is my dharma, uh, it would be a function of five things. It would be first of all, Varna dharma, Ashrama dharma, Varna ashrama dharma, um, Vishesha dharma and Sadharana dharma. Five things. What are they? Um, you know, in ancient India, society was divided into castes, into broadly into four castes. Um, that is the priestly class, the Brahmins, the warrior administrative class, the Kshatriyas, the commercial class, the Vaishyas, and the laboring classes, the Shudras. So depending on which um, caste I belong to, and even these castes, if you look at it from the Gita perspective, it comes from uh, our uh, samskaras, not what society has imposed upon us. It became a rigid social system um, with problems of privilege and exploitation and all that over the centuries. But uh, if you look at the Gita, Gita does not even talk about it being by birth. It says it's, it's, it's by your nature. Um, what is my nature? Yeah. And by nature, one might say that, but, but didn't you say my nature is existence consciousness, please? That's your identity, your reality. There are two words in Sanskrit, Swarupa and Swabhava. Swarupa is your real nature what I am really. And Swabhava is my predispositions, my tendencies, my conditioning, which is continuously changing. So at this point, I have a set of predispositions, tendencies, um, all of which are in the subtle body, not my ultimate reality. The ultimate reality, existence, consciousness, bliss is not a Brahmin or a, or a um, Kshatriya or a Vaishya. It's not a man or a woman. Uh, it's not a good or evil, none of that. But all of them depend on that reality. It's the screen on which the movie is playing. But in the movie, there are differences in characteristics. So that those differences are in my uh, nature as, nature means swabhava here, which I have developed through centuries and they, it, it inherits in my subtle body. It's also the load of karma which I am bearing. So it will work itself out that way in my life. Anyway, so I have a particular nature. So that is called Varna Dharma, that which comes from basically caste um, Dharma. And then Ashrama Dharma. What stage of life am I in? So there is a preparatory stage of life called the Brahmacharya Ashrama. Then there is um, uh, the householder life called the Grihastha Ashrama. Then there's a the next stage of life, which is basically you withdraw from too much involvement in the world, a kind of retirement for spiritual purposes, which is called Vanaprastha Ashrama. And then finally, Sannyasa, you become a, a monk, formally, informally, whichever it is, monk or monk-like, so Sannyasa Ashrama. These are stages of life, basically. Uh, so you, depending on which stage I am in, so th that's uh, the next, which will tell me what my dharma is. Then uh, there is the conjunction of the two, Varna Ashrama Dharma. So am I a Brahmin Grihastha? like a Brahmin householder or a Kshatriya Grihastha or am I, so it depends on what is the combination of these two, which stage of life and which, which caste do I belong to. That's the third one. Then there is uh, Vishesha Dharma. Vishesha Dharma means a special Dharma which comes to a person from time to time. So Arjuna, for example, is now a general of the army. So as a general of the army, he has some special duties which he would not have otherwise. At this point, some dharma comes. So you take on a role, you are a CEO or uh, um, you know, like you're a mom or something like that. And uh, that gives you special roles, which you cannot deny. If you take it on, you have to take it on. You have to admit that it's part of your dharma. And then the last one is sadharana dharma, general universal dharma every human being. We should try our best to be non-violent, should be self-controlled, uh, caring for unselfish, all the human, basic human qualities, universal human qualities. That's definitely part of our uh, dharma. So you have five. Um, so Arjuna, if you apply it, it becomes very clear. What is Arjuna's dharma? Arjuna, if you say Varna dharma, what is his caste duty? He's a, he's a warrior. He's a Kshatriya. Then um, the second one is Ashrama. What stage of life is he in? He's a householder. He's not a monk. He's not a student. He, he's a householder. And then the third one is the combination of the two. What kind of householder? He's a Kshatriya householder. 
a warrior householder uh, or one of the ruling classes. And then uh, the fourth one is any special duties at the moment, at the moment when he is asking Krishna, what should I do? One of the special duties is that he is a, a leader uh, in the Pandava camp. So that's a special uh, duty upon him. And then finally, the universal duty is common to all human beings. Put them all together. That's the answer to Arjuna's question. What should you do? And notice in the Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> Krishna does not talk about it except in the most uh, you know, marginal way. So the Bhagavad Gita is not really about what is my dharma right now. The Bhagavad Gita is actually, the, the, the setting, you know, it's a war, setting of war and Arjuna's question, what should I do right now? It seems to be a question of what is my dharma now, swadharma. But Krishna takes it beyond that. He takes it to the ultimate goal of human life. So the Bhagavad Gita is about the ultimate goal of human life, the purpose for all of this. Why even should you follow your swadharma? What's the point of it? There is a purpose. There is a high purpose to all of this. And that is God realization, enlightenment. So, um, so, so uh, Krishna talks about it throughout. In the first six chapters, the emphasis is on that enlightenment part. And then after this seventh, from the seventh chapter onwards, the emphasis will be on worship of God, bhakti, devotion. Again, throughout, self-knowledge, meditation, um, karma yoga, all will continue will all be there. Elements will be there. But the emphasis will be on devotion. And um, in the last uh, six, the emphasis will be on Brahma Jnana. Again, emphasis. Uh, but all the elements are present throughout. If you see one continuing theme throughout from the beginning till the end, Krishna is saying, therefore, you need to fight this battle. He has an ulterior motive also. He needs to get Arjuna to do his duty. Um, One very broad thing, we all know this, but it's worthwhile telling this once in a while. Whenever you're talking about yoga, or spirituality, remember, Gita is a book for, for spiritual seekers. Gita is what is called technically a moksha shastra, a scripture telling you about spiritual life. Why I'm saying this is, unless this distinction is clear, there can be confusion. I remember listening to a talk by a professor where... Um, uh, of, of Indian philosophy, where he gives a talk on Vedanta and um, you know the need for renunciation and the practice of yoga and attainment of God, cultivation of devotion, meditation. Another professor who is a committed uh, communist, um, you know, like leftist, he gives up and gives a response to this paper, and he says that this is um, you are telling us it's it's like a like a book of exploitation. You know, you're telling us that we do not have the right to enjoy life, that we do, we should not earn money, we should not you know, try to get power for the exploited classes and so on and so forth. You see, where is the problem here? The problem is that the, at the very beginning, it should have been made clear what is the Gita all about. If you want to grab power, you want to establish a communist society or a capitalist society or a theocratic society, or whatever kind of society you want to establish. If you want to redistribute wealth, you want... Uh, you know, like multiple social and political objectives. You're welcome to do so. But Gita is not, not the uh, text which discusses these things. You can, you can neither uh, go this way or that way with the Gita about it because Gita is, not, is non-committal about it. Um, then th those are what are called Dharma Shastras. Uh, there are texts, a whole class of texts, Yagya Valkasmiti, Manusmiti, many of the Puranas, which talk about morals and ethics, you know, like something like the Ramayana, for example, or Mahabharata in general, though the Gita is part of the Mahabharata in general. So the many of the Smritis, they talk about social values. And you can build upon that and get your mod, some kind of idea for a modern society from that. But the Gita is not specifically about that. And if you try to find out why I'm saying this, it has happened. Many people miss it. I remember in the Gita class at, 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 uh, at Harvard, so there were these people from Kennedy School of Government, and they said, we are interested in war. And of course, this is the right place to be, because Gita is about war. I said, no, unfortunately, you're in the wrong place. You should stay in the class. It's a very, going to be a very interesting class. But if you want to know about the views on warfare, um, about, um, you know, from the Bhagavad Gita perspective, you will be disappointed. 
you will be asking a question which the Gita will not answer. Um, but there are other texts which answer you. There are uh, texts on dharma, on the rules of warfare, on politics. There's Artha Shastra, uh, which, which talks about all of that. That's, uh, you will find that more interesting. Just because the context is a civil war, don't think that the Gita is going to talk about that. And this is obvious to anybody who starts Vedanta. This is very well understood. It's one of the fundamental foundational texts of Vedanta. You are a seeker, spiritual seeker, and Gita is a text that's going to help you. But often it's not made clear. So people who should know better, when you're studying Bhagavad Gita in the divinity school, this should be made clear. When you're giving a, a talk on the Gita and the, and the ethics of the Gita and an international conference that professor I referred to, it's very helpful to make it clear at the very beginning. Otherwise, it, that, that whole response which it drew, um, that could have been avoided. Anyway, now, fifth chapter, which is in the first, in the set of the first six chapters. So the main theme here, Pradhanya, main theme is self-knowledge. So in the fifth chapter, Arjuna starts with a question. Sanyasam karmanam krishna punar yogam chashankshasi yatshreya etayor ekam tanme bruhi sunishchitam. This is the question, the first verse of fifth chapter. O Krishna, you have taught me renunciation of action and then the performance of karma yoga. Perform action as a spiritual practice. So it's obviously contradictory. Tell me which one is better for me. Which, which will lead me to the highest. Shreya means the highest. Highest here always means moksha, enlightenment. What will lead me to enlightenment? Um, so the rest of the chapter is the is an um, um, answer to this question. But what Krishna does is very interesting. He teases the question apart into two clear ideas and which shows why Arjuna is confused about it. Two clear ideas. One is, are you asking about the way of life, whether um, you're going to be a householder, you're going to be a monk, or are you asking about spiritual practice, jnana yoga, karma yoga? If you are asking, why is this important? If you are asking whether I should continue to be a, um, you know, like a householder, you know, um, grihastha kshatriya, a warrior householder and can I attain enlightenment in this way or do I need to become a monk and it would be always be an important question in a society where monasticism is valued always there will be a tendency to mix up spirituality with monasticism so do I need to do that do I need to become a monk or so in that case that, that would be one question the other question would be uh, do I need to practice karma yoga or can I go straight to jnana yoga? Or do I need to, will karma yoga by itself be enough? No need to go to jnana yoga. The practices, the actual spiritual practices. So why is this important? Because if it is the first question, do I need to become a monk? The answer Krishna gives is no. You have an option there. You can, you may, but you need not. You may not. You can still become enlightened there are any number of cases of, you know, like people who have become enlightened, attained Brahma Jnana, and you get examples throughout our tradition, who are householders, who are married, they are engaged in professions, they have children, and they become enlightened. So that is possible. Or you could become a monk, that's also possible. Here there's an option. And it's a matter of choice. Ultimately, not so much of a matter of choice also. A lot of it is determined by our past karma. But still, uh, one could be either. Or, if you are asking about spiritual practice, then the answer is, uh, no, that you have no choice. You have to do both. Uh, you have to do karma yoga and jnana yoga. If it's a question of spiritual practice, then first karma yoga, then jnana yoga, and then moksha. The first, the preparatory spiritual practices, then the core spiritual practices of um, Advaita Vedanta, the Shravana, Manana, Niridhyasana, hearing and contemplation, meditation, enlightenment, and then freedom. Notice I'm already 
putting on the text the paradigm of Advaita Vedanta. That, that structure is already, already being imposed. Um, whereas in the other case, the householder life and the monastic life, one has a choice. One can become enlightened from um, either. Having said that, then Krishna goes on to show the um, advantages and the problems of those ways of life, monastic life and householder life. By the way, when I mean householder life today, it does not necessarily mean somebody who is married and has actually literally has a house with children. It could just mean a person who is not formally a monk. It could just mean a person who is living in the world, earning his or her living and may be engaged, may not have a family at all, may not be married at all, may be engaged in some activity in the world, just formally not a monk, not in a um, monastery, that's it. So, Krishna says, in verse number 2, Tayostu karma sanyasat karma yoga vishishyate. Better than giving up all kinds of action, becoming a monk, better than that is to remain engaged in action. And that is the householder life. Do, to do karma yoga in the householder life is better. And then he goes on to praise that option. Verse number three. Geya sa nitya sanyasi yona dveshti na kangshati nidvando hi mahabahu sukham bandhat pramuchyate. Know this person to be um, already a monk ever like a monk who in the midst of householder life is not shaken by raga dvesha, likes and dislikes, does not chase what um, is appealing, does not run away from what is forbidding or difficult, but pursues one spiritual path regardless. Nidvandu, who rises above dualities. Sukham bandhat pramuchyate. This person will easily go through spiritual life and attain uh, liberation. And then the um, very well known verse, fourth verse. Sankhya yoga prithak bala pravadanti na pandita ekam apyasthita samyag ubha yorvindate phalam. Sankhya and yoga, people who are uh, uh, ignorant or, or not wise, bala means literally means children. They consider these to be to be separate, but the pandita, the wise ones, they understand that if you take up even one approach, you will attain the result of both, which is enlightenment and liberation. So these are technical terms he uses. Sankhya here means those people who um, follow the path of monasticism. And yoga here means those people who follow the path of their householder life and the spiritual seekers. It does not mean household. It means a spiritual seeker in the householder life. Both of them, taking up one properly, one can attain to the result of both. That means the common result of both is the same. Uvaya of is the common result. So this is one interpretation, the Advaitic interpretation I'm giving you. So what, what is the point he's making here? He's saying both of these um, forms of life, householder life, spiritual seeker in the householder life, spiritual seeker uh, in the monastic life have advantages and disadvantages. First of all, the monastic life is a specialized life. It is meant only for spiritual seekers. In the householder life, one may or may not be a spiritual seeker. So like that professor who objected to the Bhagavad Gita. So you can be householder life and your whole purpose, one's whole purpose might be the accumulation of wealth and enjoying life and politics and activism and um, you know, all sorts of, nothing bad, um, all sorts of pretty worthwhile causes, but not spirituality, not enlightenment. And one can be, um, and it's, it's perfectly all right, it's approved. That, uh, you know, the conventional religion always says that one can be a good person in the world and that's it. Um, one cannot do that in spiritual life, I mean in monastic life. You cannot be a monk without, you know, without a clear a spiritual goal. Uh, one can't say, I've become a monk so that I can, I've cleared the decks to uh, become a billionaire. Now, I don't want a, a wife or children or responsibilities or anything like that. I have a one pure, one person, one pointed goal. My sadhana will be to become a billionaire. No, you can't become a monk like that. So, so in monastic life, 
it is a specialized life which is designed for spiritual practice why so consider what is meant by monastic life you give up all possessions all responsibilities you don't have duties to parents or your community don't have a family like a husband a wife children so it's an enormous amount of time and energy which is freed up um and the and the societies which approve of monasticism most religious societies do except some which do not have monastic traditions but others have it even traditions which do not have monastic traditions like uh, say islam or judaism even they have traditions of you know like ascetics and sufis and you know um, uh, in the jewish tradition there always have been mystics uh, so one may become a kind of monastic life is is available there and of course in buddhism jainism there are heavily monastic oriented and christianity and hinduism have both uh, you know like householder monastic both together um sikhism is the householder religion but with great regard for monasticism though they don't have an internal monastic tradition so um, the goal is you are freed up for the pursuit of um of spirituality for your for your uh, spiritual practices only thing is the problem there is that uh, unless the mind is prepared for it unless one is ready to depend entirely on god remember you don't have people around to help you out you don't have the support of money or possessions uh, these are big if nothing else they are big psychological supports the big psychological supports uh, i i don't know <laughs> if i should share this is a f- funny story i won't take any names uh, once uh, i and a few other monks a very devout householder devotee in india had invited us to his house he was quite a character and he was training his an old gentleman he was training his son to become a proper devotee you know so the how to serve the monks so he was training his son we were all sitting there and he was training his son that to come his son also was in his 20s so come and uh, you know serve the bow down to the monks and you know serve the food and things like that and then he was asking one of the monks that swami that old swami i knew at that time where is he now and this swami my my, my friend said uh, oh that swami i saw him last he is uh, in you now one of our centers in the himalayas oh good uh, will you m- meet him if i when i go back there i'll meet him then he told his son look my boy get out a thousand rupees and give it to him so that the, um, he will please give it to that swami the boy is also very nice sort of uh, innocent young man he's asking all the proper questions why uh, he said uh, to his father why father what will he do with the 1000 rupees of course a monk what will he spend it on he doesn't have <laughs> he doesn't need a 1000 rupees and his father said fool you don't understand he will take it out and count it and that gives him some peace of mind <laughs> now <laughs> so one might misunderstand this story but what it means is even if you don't have any use for the money just the fact that you have a thousand rupees under your bed maybe and you take it out and count it and gives you some peace of mind now which was a very nice thing for the gentleman to think about so he is teaching his son to think in these ways so psychological support money is a psychological support a house is a psychological support people around you these are my people my relatives my children it's a kind of support fulfillment ultimately not so it really doesn't work none of these are supports the real support is only god and i must say the monks have it right but it takes a lot of strength to hold on to god alone and to depend on god alone and if one has extra goals in life like um, you know um, enjoyment you want to enjoy movies and art and have a good time in life and have a party and uh, and also enjoy family and all in that case you can't be a monk so these are certain things unless one is ready for that then one can't be a monk you must value solitude and yet the solitude must not it's a thin line between solitude and loneliness if it, if you feel lonely don't be a monk 
I remember one monk, um, you know, when he became a monk, he had got some advice from a senior monk about becoming a monk. That monk wrote to him. So this is told to me by a, uh, a very senior monk. He said, when I joined the order, this certain senior monk in Banaras wrote to me saying that, my boy, as a monk, you will give love. But if you have the hankering of receiving love, you want to be loved, never, never become a monk. That, you know, you, have, you are in the position of giving. You must be so fulfilled within that you are happy to give. In a psychological sense, love and affection and strength and protection. But if you want to lean on somebody, lean on some something other than God, then never become a monk. It can lead to serious problems, even mental problems, psychological problems. Luckily, this person who told me this clearly turned out to be a good monk because he's a senior monk and very revered figure. So what I'm saying is, unless one is prepared, one may think, and people do approach me, I'm inspired by your stories of uh, you know Himalayas, and I get scared. I don't want to ruin somebody's life by telling such stories. That's why many monks don't tell the stories. They might give a wrong signal. Oh, it's so nice and beautiful and peaceful. Let me run away to the Himalayas. And people have actually. And I always tell them, don't do it. Or if you do it, then do it carefully, very thoughtfully in, in the sense that Try it out for a few weeks. Go to a place like that and stay. And don't be uh, rash. That's straight from Manhattan to a cave in Gangotri. No, don't do that. You might think that's a wonderful thing to do. Burn all the bridges. From now on, I shall. Unless you are the rare, you know, like tiny 0.0001% highly qualified spiritual aspirant, which you know, Krishna talks about, one in a thousand. Um, spiritual seeker, not one in a thousand general population, one in a thousand spiritual seeker who is capable of that. Otherwise, what will happen is, it's very simple and it's common sense. What is wonderful at the beginning, snow-clad peaks and no responsibilities in the world and nobody, you know, Swami Vivekananda said, forgotten by the world and the wor world forgetting. Notice the language. You are forgotten by the world forgets you very fast. <laughs> you drop out of sight, you are out of sight, out of mind. The world forgets you very fast. Whether you are a monk or in a, you know, a lot of retired people feel that. Nobody cares for me anymore. You are right. Nobody actually cared for you earlier also. Just an illusion that you had. The people cared for me. Now it's just beginning to, you're beginning to understand now. So the world forgets very fast. And you forget the world slowly. It sort of seeps out of you slowly. If you have that kind of attitude, very good. At first, it seems like that. But if one is not prepared, if the mind is not purified, what will soon happen is all those beautiful mountain peaks and the solitude and all will soon become rocks and howling wind and snow and water and loneliness. And then you will, people don't like it at all. It it's, becomes unbearable. I've actually met such people. Uh, at least a couple of people who came and confided to me. I don't in the mountains there. I don't like it anymore. I'm unhappy. So preparation without preparation, monastic life is not possible. It's difficult, and it will not serve the purpose. It will not serve the purpose. The whole purpose is to have a peaceful mind and to you know clear the decks for uh, intense spiritual practice. If the mind is not peaceful, if I'm lonely and unhappy and troubled by desires, and I forcefully sit there, two things will happen. Either one persists in it, becomes either hip, a hypocrite or mentally unbalanced, or one, you know, sort of, uh, again, falls back into uh, worldly life. So that's not desirable. That's why Sri Krishna says, on the other hand, in householder life, uh, if you are a karma yogi, you convert your uh, work, your activities, your responsibilities, all of that into spiritual practice. But it has to be done deliberately. You can't just say, oh, Krishna said be a householder, I'm a householder, so I'm going to become enlightened. No, no way. You have to become a spiritual practitioner there and then one becomes, one is fit for enlightenment. Um, 
But if one is successful as in a monastic life, one can become enlightened. And successful spiritual seeker in the householder life, one can become enlightened. That's why he says in the sixth verse of the fifth chapter, Sanyasas to Mahabaho Dukkha Maptum Ayogata Yoga Yukto Munir Brahma Nachirena Digachati. Monastic life without purification, without having done Karma Yoga before that, is very difficult, he says. Dukkham Prapta, which is very difficult to attain and hold on to without proper preparation, initial preparation. I remember when uh, I felt the same when I, when I first went to the Himalayas for the, for the first time I was outside the ashram, outside the discipline of a monastery. And I enjoyed it thoroughly. There is, um, you know, no responsibilities of the ashram. Lots of work was there in the ashram, like a school or a college I had to run. None of that. And I'm totally free. Whole day is for me. And I can meditate and study just once or twice in a day. I go for my food and that also is given to me. And nobody bothers me. And this is this spectacular scenery all around and I'm alone with nature. And there's a very holy vibration in the Himalayas there. It's very uplifting. Wonderful. Then the thought occurred to me, oh, why didn't I do this straight away? I should have run away from home and come here to the mountains. Why did I spend 10 years as a trainee in the Ramakrishna mission? And I very quickly realized it's because of those 10 years of training that I'm enjoying this now. If I had not done those 10 years of training, if straight from my college I had made a beeline for the Himalayas, I met such examples who went straight from, you know, just what they were doing in the world without any initial preparation, without studying, without um, getting good habits, you know, of meditation, of a simple austere life go straight to the mountains and then it's like a train wreck. So Dukkha Maptama Yogata, without Karma Yoga, without the preparation, it's very difficult. What is the preparation? The seventh uh, verse. So I realized that's why Swami Vivekananda, even if you're going to be a monk, what, what we do in the ashram is all the Karma Yoga practices, all the preparatory practices are there. You don't straight away give an emphasis on Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. No. You're going to be in training for 10 years. You're going to be engaged in ceaseless, unselfish activity. You're going to get not only the ideal of a high life uh, and uh, simple living and high thinking, simple living, high thinking, not just ideal, but actually live it. And living it means getting the body mind used to it. It becomes natural. We get used to it very soon. But you have to go through that training. So the seventh verse says, Yoga Yukta, having done Karma Yoga, then Vishuddhatma, the result is purification of mind. Vishuddhatma means purification of mind. Vijitatma, mind is under control. Here, the, here the second Atma refers to the body. And the third one is Jitendriya, control of senses. Body, mind, senses come under control. Sarva Bhuta Bhutatma Kurvan Napi Nalipyate. One can realize the, uh, the, so the consciousness within all beings. This preparation is essential. So, Karma Yoga is essential. Monasticism optional, but uh, the initial preparation of Karma Yoga is essential. So, to answer your question, O Arjuna, should I give up work or should I do work? If you mean by giving up work, because he knows what's in Arjuna's mind. I will not fight this battle, I'll go and become a monk. If you mean that, that's optional. And if you mean, should I do this work as Karma Yoga and then get the results, then go on to Gyana Yoga, then that's not optional. You have to. That preparation is necessary. Whether you are in householder life or in monastic life. Just a little note here. Traditional Vedantic monasticism, as envisaged by Shankaracharya, they uh, sort of took it for granted that you are qualified to be a monk. And therefore, one gets the vows of sannyasa. There's an initial period of preparation and study, and then gets the vows of sannyasa. And then, how, what do you do? You spend your life shravana, manana, nididhyasana. Um, you study the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, the Bhagavad Gita under competent teachers, spend time in contemplating it, in meditation, and a very austere 
uh, world renouncing lifestyle until you get that breakthrough aham brahmasmi realization comes and that continues then become a jivan mukta now the thing is a lot of people who come into monastic life they are not fully qualified for this so what will happen the signs are very easy to see uh, either a person you know i met this person in in uh, gangotri who i uh, was not doing anything at all you know he was a monk and had been a monk for more than two decades and i said don't you do any work in your ashram he said no there are people to do the work uh, worship no there is a priest to do the worship don't you study no don't you do japa repetitions of uh, name no nothing particular then what do you do nothing just like that and he's very unhappy obviously and he was saying that all the work that you do in the ramakrishna mission it's so good that you have unselfish work to do you know like an ashram to run schools uh, hospitals people your life is meaningful i thought what can i do for this person so at that time i was attending a, a classes in advaita vedanta uh, from a very good monk there in the mountains so i said why don't you come to the class at least make a beginning so he said he was very eager yes he'll come and he did come and he sat in a prominent place made sure that i saw him that he was in the class but very soon i saw he was fidgeting he was looking around and looking this way yawning um the class was on ashtavakra that's the highest advaita vedanta now there were others rest of us who many of us who were enjoying it thoroughly and this uh, monk was totally bored he didn't know what was going on it doesn't make any sense to him so that initial preparation is very important it says so once the uh, initial preparation is over it it, um, it leads to purification so the note i wanted to add here was so you will see in uh, the ramakrishna mission in our order we also belong to the 10 orders of monks started by shankaracharya but see the way it has been tweaked you have 10 years of preparation and in those 10 years of preparation the karma yoga krishna is talking about the preparatory practices unselfish work regular meditation a very austere lifestyle you know uh, minimal uh, use minimal resources uh, and uh, live a very simple life uh, practice of devotion all of those are compulsory and you do it for 10 years and that prepares the mind he says vishuddha my prepares purifies the mind and then one is uh, pre- ready for for gyana yoga and that gyana yoga has men- been mentioned here from the 13th verse onwards important concept verse number 13 sarva karmani manasa sanyasya aste sukham vashe navadware pure dehi naiva kurvanna karayan giving up all works in by uh, in your mind in your understanding you relax in a- absolute serenity and peace R- uh, knowing the reality in this uh, the city of nine gates one does not do work nor does work to be uh, nor causes work to be done now this is an important concept remember the whole discussion was about arjuna's question was about should i do it or should i not do it now he says that he has a very subtle distinction is making when are you ready for gyana yoga what happens then what happens then is we it suddenly makes sense that i am not the body mind you think about it the lower self and the higher self you can use these two words though these are not words used here but lower self would be body mind with reflected consciousness um this sthula sharira sukshma sharira with the reflected consciousness um, this is called chidabhasa it literally notice what it refers to this body we can clearly see this body and this mind which i have got thoughts feelings ideas this personality and i am aware of course i am aware that's the reflected consciousness here there is an ego which is part of the, one of the activities of the mind it's called ahankara this is my identification this is who i think i am beyond question 
as long as i think this i need karma yoga yeah. i need to control the activities of this body mind because that's my entire identification no matter how much i read about i am brahman i am the witness consciousness as i go on purifying the mind it this vedantic idea suddenly makes sense and just about all of us we are at this transitional stage where we understand what is meant by witness consciousness but we can't it's very difficult for us to live it now it makes clear sense that i am not the body not the mind not even the reflected consciousness and that so when i think about myself it's not the ego i am the witness of the ego i am consciousness itself not the reflected consciousness it's like i am the original face not the face reflected in the mirror this difference becomes clear once this difference becomes clear one persists one stays with it until it becomes a living realization that staying with it is called gyana yoga that uh, studying of the of the texts continues shravana continues manana continues but now you are ready for nididhyasana also this clarity is there you stay with that once you stay with that one consequence is what krishna has mentioned here renunciation of action which was what arjuna asked first this is the real renunciation of action what is the real renunciation of action manasa sanyasya in your in one's understanding one realizes i am this consciousness which does not act which in fact cannot act this awareness it's like the light um, on a stage the actors come and act the light re- reveals the activities when the actors go away and the stage is blank the light reveals the blank stage similarly consciousness is there and consciousness illumines the body mind and the ego the ego with the body mind does many activities i shine upon it when the body falls asleep the mind goes to sleep the ego is asleep blank i shine upon it the reference of the i has shifted from body mind with reflected consciousness lower self to the higher self which is consciousness alone what am i i am not consciousness mind body together this bundle no i am clearly awareness alone and i am aware i i shine upon this bundle of body mind and that enables this body mind to act so this consciousness does not do anything is not an uh, is not a doer is not uh, does not do any karma is always free of karma this understanding of our real nature as consciousness ever free of karma this is called renunciation of karma it's a crucial understanding krishna makes this thing clear once you understand that this is who you are you are beyond karma neither do you do any karma nor have you done any karma nor do the results of karma affect you you need nothing from karma you don't need to accumulate pleasures you don't need to avoid pain pleasure and pain are that level of body and mind you shining everything is revealed so i am vivekananda makes it very clear good good bad bad and none escape the law so that's the law of karma then he makes it clear who cannot escape karma whosoever wears a form must wear the chain too wears a form means body mind everybody has body mind even an enlightened person has a body mind but we think we are this Uh, whatever we may have read or whatever we may believe but we feel we are this then we are wearing the chain as long as we wear the uh, we are wearing the form as long as we wear the form there is a chain tied to this form this form is is causal it's born of causality past karma and conditioning has given rise to this body and this mind and so um, we are in the realm of karma good will give rise to good bad will give rise to bad um, punya good action dharma will give rise to happiness adharma will give rise to unhappiness and it's a continuous stream that goes on you have to carefully avoid uh, immoral unethical action and carefully take every action to do what is good what is proper what is dharmic uh, karma yoga is there that's a spiritual practice but then what about vedanta then swami vivekananda says but far beyond name and form is atman ever free no thou art that sanyasi bold say om tat sat mom 
So this far beyond name and form is Atma never free. It is this consciousness which Krishna is talking about in this verse. You are that. One more point and I'm done. At this point, many people come to an understanding of this. This is what we are talking about. If you do stay with Vedanta, you come to... And it's, not, it's not all that difficult. One just needs to color one's mind with Vedanta to begin to see the, with clarity what is being meant here. But it's difficult to live it. To live it, one advanced practice for that is meditation. One must soak oneself in this understanding. So meditation has many benefits. Meditation has benefits at the level of karma yoga. Meditation has benefits at the level of jnana yoga. Also. In jnana yoga, it becomes nididhyasana. But before that also, concentration of mind is the secret to all success, whether in the world or in spiritual life. In spiritual life, it is the secret to success in karma yoga. It is the secret to success in jnana yoga also. That's why Krishna introduces the theme of meditation. Though Arjuna did not ask for a change, did not ask a question about meditation, Krishna introduces that theme and he will start the next uh, chapter by himself without any prompting from a, a question from Arjuna. Okay. Mm, let me quickly take a look at the discussion. Patrick Cawthorn asks, is it true that ancient Indians felt that they were on a progression from one caste to another over lifetimes? Is that referenced in the scriptures? Yes, the belief was our nature goes from um, you know, a Shudra nature to a Vaishya nature to a, a Kshatriya nature to a Brahminical nature. That is, uh, But uh, that became fixed into the rigid caste system which is uh, uh, a huge problem in Indian society. But in, in terms of Gita or the original understanding was that over lifetimes, we are evolving. We are means the mind, the subtle body is getting better, more subtler, uh, more, more sattvic, more spiritual, more capable of spirituality. It is evolving. That evolution itself is talked about in this term of progression of, uh, of caste natures, which is in today's uh, world, it's not a politically correct way of putting it. You can just say that we become more spiritual over time. But the teachers of Vedanta were agreed upon this. Shankaracharya's introduction to uh, Bhagavad Gita, Swami Vivekananda in this age, he always says it is the, to promote the Brahminical nature, that all spiritual uh, endeavors are there. Shankaracharya says it is to to protect and promote the Brahminical nature that God comes as, um, as an uh, avatar. That's the very beginning of the, his uh, com uh, introduction to the commentary on Bhagavad Gita, Adi Shankaracharya. Swami Vivekananda said, all people should be raised to the status of a Brahmin, in, in the sense of the culture of the Brahmin. Uh, not in the sense of uh, actual uh, physical caste, that's uh, either politically incorrect, or meaningless, or it, it makes no point, makes no sense in, in modern society, and especially in societies outside India, who are, wouldn't care less about what caste people come from. Yeah. I remember this conference. At the, again, at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, somebody was talking about a particular uh, um, stotra, hymn, uh, some speaker who had come from India. And one of the students there questioned that speaker. The student was also Indian, but studying at, at the Harvard Kennedy School. He said, oh, but that the hymn has been written by uh, a Brahmin. Uh, so isn't it Brahminical? Why should we follow that? And the speaker said something, but it struck me, this is an entirely wrong-headed way of going about the whole thing. It's like saying, a, prof, uh, a scholar quotes a particular paper, citation, this paper. And if you suddenly say, but the, it has been written by a professor of the Harvard Kennedy School, why should I follow that? Obviously, the hymns were written by, mostly by Brahmins, because they were the priests, they were the intellectuals, they were the, um, you know, the Sanskrit knowing scholars, and it was their job to study the scriptures, to practice this and to teach others. It's just like saying, 
I will not quote uh, a paper if it's written by a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School. Well, who else will write a paper if it's not a professor? <laughs> I'll write, I will only accept papers written by non-professors, non-academicians. That's a silly thing to say. So you see, this is what happens when uh, sort of politics crosses with, uh, um, uh, with philosophy or spirituality. Uh, Vishwanathan says, Swamiji, does it happen that scholars, students make the same kind of mistakes, misconstruing the intent behind other spiritual texts like the Bible? A cultural problem in India, on the other hand, many see it as a religious text, fo focusing instead on memorizing the verses. I'm not sure exactly what you mean, but I'm reminded of one thing. Um, it's maybe not the answer to your question, but I'll just share it anyway. In one of the classes, um, I keep referring to my experience at the Divinity School because it's recent, last year. And also it's my most direct interaction with academicians uh, in the field of uh, philosophy and religion. So in one of the discussions, our professor was talking about going directly to the text instead of commentaries and explanations. This is like an ongoing tussle I had with the professor. He insisted on teaching the Upanishads directly. So imagine over a period of four or five months, you are going to read most of the Upanishads in English translation without the help of any commentary. The result is that uh, for most people and who don't have a background, okay, I've been studying this all the time and professor has been studying this all his life. But a person who comes into it for the first time, one lady, she said, it's like looking at a flying saucer. What does this mean? Uh, all of this. She's coming from a Judeo-Christian background. I mean, they were all scholarly people there. I mean, but, but they had different training. Without a layer of commentary, without a little, little like ease into it, you can't understand the Vedas. Upanishads are part of the Vedas. It's, it's very difficult to understand. Imagine trying to understand uh, Bhridharanik Upanishad without Shankara's commentary. Either one won't understand anything, then one is safe, or one will misunderstand. <laughs> will completely misunderstand. So um, the professor was saying in, in a talk, let's see, we must go to the scripture directly. Where does this come from? It's called sola scriptura. It comes from the Protestant war cry, you know, in the uh, after Martin Luther, um, around 500 years ago, his revolt against the Catholic Church that the Bible is being misinterpreted and layers of commentary are being given by the Catholic Church and it's in Latin, we can't read it, and so on and so forth. Luckily at that time, just at that time, the Gutenberg press had been invented. And so Martin Luther was one of the first, you know, he was right after him, the Bible was translated into German and into other local languages, which you know, European languages, which people could read. And the emphasis was go back to the scripture. And he, he talked about the difference uh, you know, interpretations which came up, going, the importance of going back to the scripture, not listening to what um, the church, or the Catholic church is telling you. So there I had an insight, uh, which I shared with the professor and the class. I said, you can do this. So this relates to the question which you're asking. You can do this with the Bible because it's being spoken directly to the people. You can do it with the Bhagavad Gita also. If you translate the Gita directly and, and try to read it, it will make sense. But if you try to do it with the Kenu Upanishad or um, the Chandogya Upanishad, the Brihadaranik Upanishad or the Vedic Karmakandas, the hymns, it will make a very vague kind of sense or no sense at all. Uh, so the Vedic texts were not being spoken directly as sermons to the people. They were in, as a part of a very sophisticated culture. You would have to be introduced into the culture, the terminology, and what was what they're trying to do there in order to understand what's going on. So I said, what you are trying to do, you're treating the Upanishads like the um, Gita or the Bible. But the Upanishads and the Vedas in general can't be treated like this. So this is the point I was trying to make. Um, and, and then I asked the professor, go back to the scripture so that you can find the original meaning of the scripture. And I said, how is that going? The last 400 years, look at the number of denominations you have in the United States. You had one interpretation, layer of interpretation by the Catholic Church. Now by some uh, measure, three or 400 different interpretations you have got. Result of what? Going back to the scripture. 
you end up with a much more sympathy for the catholic church then you begin to realize what they were doing was is inevitable it's bound to happen there is a value in going directly to the bhagavad gita in one should but also value in reading the commentaries in the case of the upanishads one must read the commentaries some commentary at least that's why i kept on arguing they said i mean the, the professor told me that when you're reading the upanishad swami keep your shankar out of this i'm sorry we're going to leave shankar out of this i said i have no particular problem with shankar or, or ramanuja but you take one story i understand these are narrative these are interpret interpretations but take one at least and then you can disagree then you can get your own ideas otherwise it becomes all over the place you have no way of understanding you have first of all people without any background people who are not practitioners all believers and then within the period of 3 4 months with all assignments and all trying to understand a 5000 year old culture which is completely alien to you no no wonder uh, that lady said it's like looking at a flying saucer does it happen that scholars to make the same kind of mistakes of misconstruing yes i think they do prabir babu saying in advaita vedanta what is the real purpose of meditation i think it cannot be realizing brahman correct technically the purpose of nididhyasana in advaita vedanta if i want to put it very precisely the purpose of nididhyasana in advaita vedanta is to overcome the obstacle called viparita bhavana what is viparita bhavana the contrary tendencies which our mind it goes back to that swabhav i talked about for lifetime after lifetime we have infused the mind soaked the mind muddied the mind it lot of conditioning remember the mind is also material it is helpful in enlightenment it's also material even when you have got the enlightenment the mind will go on according to its tendencies if the tendencies have not been reformed refined and uh, purified then you're going to have problems even after enlightenment And this question some genuine spiritual seekers have slips and falls losing that suddenly you know, like losing the temper or you see or more serious problems in uh, coming up in life of they are not all frauds many of them are genuine uh, spiritual seekers with uh, some genuine insight also still they slip and fall why because that initial peer, uh, purification has not happened enlightenment by itself will not change the mind it will it will free you the enlightened then what the, what good is enlightenment enlightenment vidyarnya swami makes it very clear in his jeevan mukti viveka even if you um, whatever happens if you once you get that breakthrough you have got moksha at the point of death krishna also says brahma nirvanam um, we will not come back to life again i mean into into this cycle of birth and death again but then what's the harm the harm is this one will not get jeevan mukti unless the mind is purified unless you have a saint's mind a saintly mind one will not get jivan mukti and so for the purpose of jivan mukti attainment of enlightened living one must try to purify the mind and for that nididhyasana is very very important and in more lives of most gyanis you will find um, it's it's actually an effort an important effort that's done uh, even after initial breakthrough they stay with it Ramana Maharshi stayed with it for months and months, completely absorbed in, in that, soaked in it. Sri Ramakrishna stayed with it. Many others. So that is the, the exact purpose of Nidhi Dhyasana. It is to uh, remove viparita bhavana, contrary tendencies, which obstruct the manifestation of your realization. You see the beauty of Swami Vivekananda's definition of religion. Religion is the manifestation of the divinity already within us. He said, my mission in life is to to preach unto humanity their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life see manifest in every movement of life the divinity must shine through in our thinking in our speaking and in our uh, actions yeah so nidhid dhyasana is helpful for that in more simple terms uh, if one has a doubt you know that uh, i understand it i am very clear about it and yet it feels a little incomplete then you stay with it that nididhyasana is very very useful there um abhijit says we hear that vedanta used to be practiced by busy kings in ancient times which seems to suggest that gyana yoga and karma yoga go really well together 
that is both are more of natural pa partners versus compared to forced or strenuous combination is this thinking correct yes basically what krishna says here manasa sanyasya the automatic natural renunciation of action which comes by realizing i am the action less consciousness that will happen but that does not mean the activities at the level of body will cease if the enlightened person is a monk running an ashram will continue to run the ashram if the enlightened person is a king running a kingdom will continue to administer the kingdom but if you ask the king are you doing action or not really no really i am the um, ever unchanging consciousness so yes they are they are very natural i can't help adding the technically to make it correct from a gyana yogi's perspective once a person realizes i am brahman action may continue but the action will be at the level of appearance or you can say the action itself is brahman that brahma atmanam brahma habi that one from the enlightened person's perspective he does not feel that he is combining gyana yoga and karma yoga he just feels that i have realized i am brahman all is brahman Uh, Pradeep Bose is asking, leaning or depending upon one's human guru, is that not all right for a monk? At least initially, certainly. Leaning or depending on God, leaning or depending on guru is definitely, it's absolutely fine. And at, at the beginning, that is the support for us. All right. Let me ask, um, Bindu has raised her hand. We'll just take that question and stop. We've gone well over time. Um, no question, Maharaj. I just wanted to thank you uh, so much. You answered, I don't know if you remember from the last Vedanta Life Academy, you answered my question um, there two Thursdays ago. And however much uh, you have talked, uh, you know, it struck home that time. I've heard it many, many times. And uh, just my heartfelt gratitude um, for changing my life. Um, for continuing to remove my doubts. And uh, I've been shy that I haven't introduced myself properly, but I did in Hollywood, you came, I introduced myself and I saw you in, New in, in Washington, DC. So um, I, I just wanted to formally thank you. Um, thank you. That's a, yeah. that's a good note to end this class <laughs> thank, thank you, you so everybody. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu